good to be with you again. It's a treat to be here. I know quite a few of you, and uh, it's just wonderful. Thank you to the worship team as well. Um, I particularly, I, I enjoyed all the songs, particularly noted the Chain Breaker. I thought that would make a great series on Netflix, a superhero <laughs> every week, new chains being broken. And in fact, this is a little bit what the Gospel of Mark does, particularly in Mark 5, where you have this demon-possessed man whose chains he would break every so often, but they would always come back. You know, it took Jesus Christ to break those chains permanently. And so I invite you to read that story whenever you have a minute. And now to Psalm 116. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey rather than a war horse, like a regular king might have done, he sent a powerful message about both about the kind of king that uh, he was, the kind of kingdom that he represented, and the, the kind of God that he reflected. His rule would not be instituted and maintained by the use of force, which has sadly too often been the case. By entering Jerusalem in this matter, Jesus signaled something new and wonderful about ultimate reality and the real king. The God of Israel revealed himself in a world, to, to the ancient Hebrews, he revealed himself in a world populated by numerous uh, uh, nature deities, powerful gods that men and women intensely feared. And so being from the same period, the same culture, you'd expect ancient Israelites to harbor the same attitude of fear towards their God. You would expect it, but there is something else going on in ancient Israel, something wonderful something never seen before. Let me read you uh, from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. It's called the Shema Yisrael. This is a formula that, you know, devout Jews uh, recite every day. I do it myself. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, which really refers to the mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. According to this great text, exuberant love, not terror, must govern the, belie the believer's attitude towards God. Love that oozes from every pore of our body. Love that's all in. Love that gushes from the deepest part of our soul. Psalm 116 contains one of the most unabashed declarations of love towards God found in the book of Psalms. In fact, that very formula we're going to look at only occurs once. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. I love the Lord. In the original Hebrew text, we have here an odd sentence. I was asked to speak on that psalm once, and so I decided to take a very good look at it. And so when I read it in Hebrew, it seemed odd to me. Of course, I don't trust my own judgment of what may seem odd in Hebrew or not. I'm not a, I'm not a you know, it's not my mother tongue. It's a, it's a working language for me. So I checked a little bit further, and I discovered that I wasn't the only one who discovered that it was an odd construction. Literally, it reads like this, I love for he hears the Lord, my voice, and suppli supplications. The psalmist brings together the object of his love with the reason for his love. It is awkward. Those are the words of a man whose mouth cannot contain the joyful explosion of his heart. It's as if the psalmist was falling all over himself. I love, I love, a hafti. For he hears the Lord, my voice and supplications. Of course, we don't translate it like that because it's awkward. Now, 
Why does the psalmist burst with such love towards God? Well, the answer is found in the second part of that verse. He hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. You know, <clears throat> when I've been married for almost, oh, can it be? 40 years? Hmm. There must be a mistake somewhere. I'll check, all right? But I think it's 40. Good thing my wife isn't here this morning. I'd be in deep trouble. But you know what? I think women, when they speak to their husbands, are not always convinced that they actually listen to them. Is it just me? <laughs> That's about as far as I'm going to go there because this is very dangerous territory. So women, I think, are not, at least my wife, uh, let's not, you, you know, I know all of you men listen to your wives very, very carefully. You hang on every word they say. But I can't say the same thing for me, right? Sometimes I don't quite listen, as in, and, and she notices, and then I'm in trouble. But anyways, what may be true for some husbands is not true for God. God intensely listens to those who cry to him. Regardless of the situation or the state of mind you find yourself in, God hears you. As soon as we mumble the merest whisper towards him, he leans right in. He is suddenly and instantly in your face. He's this close. He is infinitely interested in what you have to say. Verse 2, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Verses 1 and 2 summarize the entire psalm. They describe an extraordinary dynamic, a profound mutuality, if you will, between love for God, God's constant attention to the needs of his people, and a continued attitude of dependence on God. The psalmist loves God not just out of some vacuum, you know, reality. He loves God because God hears his voice and supplications. And because he's convinced that God is paying attention to him, he's ever more encouraged and determined to call on him. It's like a it's like an endless positive spiral. The more you pray, the more he listens. The more you convince he listens, the more you pray. As we learn to see how God cares for us, as we experience his love, our love grows for him. And at some point, it becomes exponential. We fall all over ourselves. Words become insufficient to express what we feel. I love, I love the Lord. And here the word that is used to refer to the Lord is the word Yahweh. And this is very intentional, for Yahweh is the God of the covenant. It's the relationship God. It's the personal God. The psalmist uses the word Yahweh to emphasize intimacy. And that's unique, ladies and gentlemen. Trust me, in the ancient Near East, people, men and women, did not have an intimate relationship with their gods. It was transactional, and that was it. The relationship the Hebrews were to have with their God, as I explained last week, was to be relational, was to be personal. Death, verse 3, death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the, great, of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord, please God, please Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is, how good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. In these verses, the psalmist describes how God saved his life. Death had come like a powerful foe and tied him as would a brutal invader. No exit in sight. Just like a man condemned to die by hanging. Hands <clears throat> bound behind his back. A noose around his neck. There is no more hope. The terrors of his impending demise overwhelm him like a thick and impenetrable fog. You'd think that a man in such dire straits would just resign himself to his fate. Well, not this man, not the psalmist. 
those who follow the Lord never just roll over and die. The psalmist rebels against his situation and calls on Yahweh because he knows who Yahweh is. And you know who he is? He's gracious, he's just, and he is merciful. Gracious, just, and merciful. In verse 5, the psalmist uses the word Elohim to refer to God. You see, if Yahweh denotes the relational, the, uh, the relationship side of God, Yahweh denotes his power. You need both, right? In the beginning, God created. Bereshit bara Elohim, right? Elohim is used because you need a God of infinite power to create a universe in which there might be a trillion galaxies. So you need both. You need Yahweh, the relationship God, but you also need Elohim, the God of power. When you have those two together, uh, you can get some business done. So this, this infinitely powerful God of the universe is also merciful. He extends his mercy, his undeserved grace, even to those who don't deserve it. And that's what mercy means. So if you've done something, if you feel undeserving, well, you're in, good, you're in a good place today. Because this God loves to extend his grace to people who don't deserve it. Verse 6, the Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death and he saved me. Let my soul be at rest again for the Lord has been good to me. He saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. I believed in you, so I said, I'm deeply troubled, Lord. And my anxiety cried out to you, those people are all liars. What do we need to benefit from the grace of God? What do we need to benefit from the grace of God? Human beings are in the business of paying for stuff. We always wonder, are we good enough for this, good enough for that? Are we good enough for God? You know what you need? I'm going to tell you what you need. You need the heart of a child. The kind of trust and confidence a little boy a little girl will express towards his or her dad or his or her mom. You see, arrogance gets us nowhere with God, the living God. When it comes to relating to God, humility is the name of the game. Those who simply and sincerely seek God's help will experience God's salvation and will once again find themselves in a place of rest and contentment. No matter, regardless of how difficult our situation might be, the psalmist shows us what we need to do, and that is simply cry to God. Verse 12, what can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The Lord cares deeply when his loved ones die. O oh Lord, I am your servant. Yes, I am your servant. Born into your household. You freed me from my chains. Ah, our song, the chain breaker. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the house of the Lord, in the heart of Jerusalem. The psalmist has a problem, and it's a wonderful problem to have. What do you offer in return for someone who saves your life? How do you repay the paramedic who offers life-saving assistance at the scene of an accident? Sometimes we don't even know their names. How do you repay the cancer specialist who pulls you away from sure death? Maybe some of you have experienced that. When my brother and I became Christians in 1975, <clears throat> back then, young people, the dinosaurs walked the earth. <laughs> Scientists believe they disappeared because of an asteroid in northern Quebec. It, they didn't. We overhunted them. 
dinosaur steak, best thing in the world. Short view. Anyways, I miss those days. <laughs> Anyways, when my brother and I became Christians in 1975, the pastor of the church and his wife, they took us under their wings. They welcomed us into their home. They had us for meals. They spent time with us. They made us feel like we mattered. And it was so incredibly significant for us because we didn't have that feeling at all. They had an incredible impact on our lives. And I've, I've often asked my brothers, how could we ever repay them for what they did for us? And you know, the fact is, we can't repay them. And certainly not now. They both passed away. We can only say thank you to them and live in a way that honored the investment they made into our lives. That's all we could do. You see, when everything is said and done, there is nothing God wants from us except our gratitude, our love, and a commitment to reflect his character in our lives. It's not the end of the world. It's always a win-win a situation with our God, never a lose-lose. It was always lose-lose with the gods of the ancient Near East. Ancient Mesopotamians always looked for, you know, how, how can we please our gods? And ultimately, they always came to the same conclusion. Child sacrifice. Because ultimately, they discovered that nothing satisfied the gods. Flesh and blood, human life, is what the gods expected. Not with our God. With our God, it's win-win. He wins, we win. He cares for us, and in return, he simply wants us to live in a way that will create life for us and life around us. What more do you want? Even in death, and it's funny, as I get older, I think about that a little bit more often now. I only have one ant left, so... My father's still alive. I had to tell him the other day that all the aunt, all his sisters and brothers were gone. He didn't know. I said, maybe you should go to funerals once in a while. So he was a little upset about that. But anyways, that's reality, right? So now I'm the next in line, right? I'm going to be pushed through that door one of these days. Not too soon, I hope. But You see, even in death, we have nothing to worry about. The psalmist knows that he will not elude death forever. Does that mean that God doesn't care or is limited by our mortal nature? Absolutely not. Even in the face of our greatest foe, our greatest enemy, we can be at peace. We can still worry a little bit, but fundamentally at peace. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. That's a translation that some of you are more familiar with. And Paul echoes the same thought in Romans 8.38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. You see, the bottom line is this. Those who have embraced the God, the living God, those who are members of his family have nothing to fear. Regardless of where we come from, our background, our station in life, how messed up we are, it ultimately doesn't matter. God breaks our chains let freedom reign. So how do liberated people express their gratitude? By being thankful and living in a way that reflects the wonderful freedom that we have received. Free men and women never ought to live like slaves in fear, bondage, and resentment. They ought to live with thankfulness, with dignity, with joy. A few years ago, I heard uh, a, uh, of a young man, an ex-Muslim fellow, who had turned to Jesus Christ as a young adult. <clears throat> now, you got to know, and I'm sure all of you know this, you know, I mean, 
normally, usually, accepting Jesus Christ in your life has some pretty profound uh, implications for, you know, how you think, your attitude, how you live, decisions you're going to make. It's absolutely incredible. It imprints a new identity on your soul. And I can attest to that myself. But for someone like Emmanuel, that's his new name, it entailed the real possibility that he might die for his faith. Because as you know, leaving Islam is punishable by death. In fact, persecution of Christians under Islamic regimes is one of the great scandals of our time. Emmanuel was born in the Sudan. His father was a respected imam, a clergyman, a Muslim clergyman. And Emmanuel himself was being groomed to become an imam. And at some point during his training, one of his friends posted a poem that questioned God's justice. Part of the poem goes like this. I just have a short, uh, short excerpt. It says, you cut my hands, you cut my legs, are you God or a butcher? This is the kind of reflection that we Christians do all the time. I mean, I just wrote a book. I finished a book on the problem of evil. And those are the questions you ask, right? Those are the questions people ask. And we don't lose it. We just ask them and we get into debates and we, you know, sometimes we scream at each other, but that's okay. That's what Christian thought is. But within Islam, this kind of questioning is not quite as well received. And so some of the students were outraged by the poem and ordered him to repent. Well, kid refused. And soon after that, he was killed with, as Emmanuel says, I quote, three hits of a knife to his heart. Emmanuel was devastated. He was a close friend of his. And so he wanted revenge. I can understand that. But because of the political situation, Emmanuel had to flee. He eventually found his way in the Congo. And during that whole time, one impulse, he only had one thought on his mind, one thought when he woke up this morning, and one thought when he went to bed in the evening, and that thought was revenge. He wanted to kill those guys. But something happened. To make a long story short, he met a Mennonite brethren pastor in Kinshasa, and over a period of three months, he explored the Christian faith. He eventually gave his life to Jesus Christ. That decision changed everything. His thirst, his thirst for revenge evaporated. Anger, hatred, and resentfulness were replaced by love and compassion. Bondage to law and hatred replaced by freedom. No, I cannot, I mean, I can identify a little bit with that. Those of you who know my, my, my story, my conversion story, know that I, I grew up in the 70s, right? And the 70s it was fashionable for French Canadians, for Quebecers, to hate the English, right? Ah, hate the English. I love hating the English. I didn't know any of them. Never met one, but I hated them. And hatred's a wonderful thing in a way because it's so easy to feed, eh? It starts this big, and before you know it, it takes very little fuel, and it, gets, it takes over the whole, all of you, your whole soul. But you know, when I became a Christian, I, 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 I prayed a little prayer, maybe one minute at the most. At the end of that prayer, I couldn't find the hatred anymore. I kind of missed it. It was like my precious, you know, uh, in the Lord of the Rings, eh? Gollum, eh? It was gone. What happened? And that's how I knew. I hadn't just met some kind of a, it wasn't just some fantasy in my mind. That thing was solid. It was well rooted. It's something I could hang on to, and it was gone. And it's been gone since then. I love you guys. <laughs> right? So anyways, this is what happened to uh, Emmanuel. So I hear about this guy. And at the time, he was studying at Providence College. So I contacted him. And I wanted to meet with him. I said, Emmanuel, I'm going to buy you lunch. 
free lunch for you, Manuel. And that means something, because I'm a Mennonite. I've been a Mennonite guy for quite a while. So I'm going to buy you lunch. And so at some point, I asked him, I said, what exactly convinced you to give your life to Jesus Christ? In spite of the inherent dangers of doing so, right? He said one word, one word. He said grace. In Christianity, Emmanuel discovered grace, forgiveness, the promise of eternal life, and a personal relationship with God simply for the asking. He never even imagined that God could be like that. It was completely, it's like he discovered a new planet, a new parallel world, and he fell into it. Of course, it had been a few years since he had made the decision for Jesus Christ. And I knew that on a number of occasions, he had received threats to his life. And so I asked him, follow-up question, was it worth it, Emmanuel? Without hesitation, he said, yes, it was worth it. No words could express the love and gratitude he felt towards God for extending such mercy, such grace, and such love towards him. In spite of the threats on his life, he regularly goes back to the Sudan at his own expense to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because his heart bursts with love and gratitude for what Christ did for him. Emmanuel's story is the story of millions of men and women and children who made the most important decision any human being can make. Of course, if you haven't made that decision, because you don't, you, you, don't, you don't just get born into this, you've got to make a decision at some point. Some people make it at three years old, some people at six. It doesn't take much. You don't have to take a course with me to become a Christian. I wish. I'd make more money. Look at the, uh, you know, the good thief there beside Jesus. In, in, I'm, I'm from, you know, from a Catholic family. So there was a bad thief and a good thief, right? They were both bad. But one of them is, uh, we called him the good thief. He didn't know anything. Didn't take a course with me. Didn't take systematic theology. He just leaned over. He says, hey, could you remember me? And he was in just like that. And that's a wonderful thing about becoming a Christian. There's very few re uh, prerequisites all you have to do is recognize your need, your condition, your lost condition. Recognize that Jesus Christ can take care of it. And any, anywhere you are can be right now, can be doing the dishes, can be clearing the snow, whatever it is. Starting the car, you stop for a second, you say, Jesus, I, I accept you in my life. You're in just like that, the greatest deal in the universe. Some people don't like it when I say that. Because we all have this impulse that we feel we must pay for this don't have to sincerity of a child's heart of course for those who have entered into a relationship with the living God I want to encourage you like the psalmist I want to encourage you to bring everything every concern every prayer regardless of how small or how big it may be you bring it to God because God relishes the relationship. Someone says something like, you know, God rejoices. God rejoices. There's nothing that makes God more joyful than when a person turns to him, whether it's in a new relationship or whether it's an old one. God's heart rejoices. In the same way, a mother's heart rejoices when her child comes to her and expresses love, expresses a request. If we love our children, we'll rejoice every time they turn to us. It's the same thing with God. You know, as big as the universe is, and I told you last week, I'm a bit of a, you know, I have a telescope and stuff. There's a trillion galaxies, they say, perhaps. You know what? What I find amazing, and I know that, is God would have sacrificed, he would have destroyed the entire universe for just one of us. And we know he did much more. He sacrificed his only son to save. Even if there had been only one of us, he would have sacrificed his only son to save us. Bring your concerns to God and God will intervene on your behalf. 
And as you keep doing this, you know what? Your love for God will grow. It will become eventually existential, like Psalm 116. And one day you will find yourself, like the psalmist, bursting with joy and gratitude. Matthew 21. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Israel, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in, a, in an uproar as he entered. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, he revealed the true nature of God as loving, compassionate, and just. And when the people realized that that was the case, that was the reality, they burst with joy and thanksgiving. I love the Lord because he hears my prayer and my supplications. God bless you all.